Hello there. On this week's episode of the Data Vault Radio Show, in the wake of ChatGPT having a little bit of a meltdown, we'll be taking a look at a conversation around why you need to build resilience into your data platforms uh, with Dan Lindstedt, the inventor of Data Vault. At the same time, I'll be interviewing Jonas de Cuesta from Vault Speed, and I'll be bringing you up to speed with all the news from around the data management universe. Or world. The universe is pretty big. All that and more coming up right now in the Data Vault Radio Show. Welcome to the latest episode of the Data Vault radio show. Unless you're watching or listening to this from the future, in which case this is the archive and it's not the latest episode, but it's still the future, in which case I'm really sorry about that whole climate change thing. We did try and warn the politicians and they just didn't listen. Anyway, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Paul Barlow. One of the other things I do is also coordinate the community over at the Data Vault Innovators community. It's a free site that you can join that you can go and talk to other people who work in data management from around the world, learn from the experts, pose questions to them, as well as check out things like some of the public meetups that we've got coming up, including one that we've got coming up in March in London with the help of Scalefree. But you can check out all the information for that on that forum. So to help you get there, we're going to magically put up the address, like magic. It's also in the description with a clickable link that you can go to, and it's completely free. So head along, introduce yourself, and say hi to everyone. In this week's episode, we've got a whole bunch of really fascinating stuff to sit down and look at, inspired by that horrible nightmare that happened last week when ChatGPT had weird meltdown moments giving me flashbacks to Terminator 2 and pretty much any other movie where AI goes completely insane and destroys humanity. So we're going to have a look back at a piece of content that we did in December last year with Dan Lindstedt, who's actually the inventor of Data Vault, around the need to build resilient systems and ways that we can do that. We also have a great interview today with Jonas de Kuster from uh, Vault Speed. But before we get to that, let's catch up with this week's news. Actually, before we have news, let's have some olds. Today's show falls on February 29, which is a leap year. All of the other months in the Julian calendar actually have 30 or 31 days, but February lost out to the ego of Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus. Under his predecessor, Julius Caesar, February had 30 days, and the month named after him, July, had 31. But August only had 29 days. When Caesar Augustus became emperor, he added two days to his month, to make August the same as July. So February lost out to August in the Battle of Extra Days. All the latest breaking news from ancient Rome, I guess. How about we get into the actual news around Data Vault and information management for this week. As we picked up last week, the impact of Google Gemini's 1.5 model continues to make the news with its 1 million token context window, meaning it can analyze and understand complex code bases and videos. In fact, the model can answer complex questions about the video content and has the potential to be used for in-depth coding tasks. In open source news related to code generation, something that caught our eye this week was Open Code Generator, a model developed specifically to improve the quality and speedily iterate code generation. In their paper published on Hugging Face, they announced that while the introduction of large language models has significantly advanced code generation, the challenge with open source models is that they often lack the execution capabilities and iterative refinement of advanced systems like ChatGPT for Code Interpreter. Open Code Interpreter is a family of open source code systems designed for generating, executing, and iteratively refining code. The innovative integration of execution and human feedback marks a significant leap forward in the domain. By harnessing compiler diagnostics to correct errors and incorporating human insights for code refinement, the model achieves a yet unparalleled balance of accuracy and user alignment. Its performance on widely recognized benchmarks, including human eval and MBPP, demonstrates its superior ability to iteratively refine code, achieving results that narrow the performance gap with proprietary systems like GPT-4's Code Interpreter. This model heralds a new era in code generation, offering open source systems that rival the sophistication and efficacy of their proprietary counterparts. You can find more about this on GitHub at the Open Code Generator, and we'll have a link below on the research paper for you to be able to check out as well. 
In policy news, Stanford University published a paper on February 22nd entitled Rethinking Privacy in the AI Era, Policy Provocations for the Data-Centric World, presented by Jennifer King and Caroline Meinhardt. These papers presented a series of arguments and predictions about how existing and future privacy and data protection regulation will impact the development and deployment of AI systems. Amongst those was the prediction that given that data is the foundation of all AI systems, going forward, AI development will continue to increase developers' hunger for training data, fueling an even greater race for data acquisition than we've seen in the past couple of decades. One argument mooted was that largely unrestrained data collection poses unique risks to privacy that extend beyond the individual level. They aggregate to pose societal level harms that cannot be addressed through the exercise of individual data rights alone. Another point made is that while existing and proposed privacy legislation grounded in the globally accepted Fair Information Practices, or FIPs, implicitly regulate AI development, they're not sufficient to address the data acquisition race as well as the resulting individual and systemic privacy harms. Lastly, and this one will be of particular interest to data vault professionals, is that even though different legislation contains explicit provisions on algorithmic decision making and other forms of AI, it does not provide the data governance measures needed to meaningfully regulate the data used in AI systems. So what we've done is put together three suggestions on how you could mitigate the risks to data privacy posed by the development and adaptation of AI. They include denormalizing data collection by default by shifting away from an opt-out to an opt-in collection. Data collectors must facilitate true data minimization through privacy by default strategies. Number two, focus on the AI data supply chain to improve privacy and data protection. Ensuring data set transparency and accountability across the entire life cycle has to be the focus. And then thirdly, flip the script on the creation and management of personal data. Policymakers should support the development of new governance mechanisms and technical infrastructure, for example, data intermediaries and data permissioning infrastructures that support the exercising of individual data rights. For more information on this paper and to access your own copy, there'll be links in the bio below. Last up this week is GROQ, spelled G-R-O-Q, a groundbreaking language processing unit, a physical chip that resides next to the CPUs and GPUs to specifically speed up language processing, transforming the end user experience as they interact with LLMs using natural language. To put that in context, it means it can run programs like Meta's Llama 2 LLM far faster than before. With the explosion of LLMs, the graphics processing unit is probably the weakest link in the generative AI ecosystem, and Grok is an inference engine on a chip. It's designed to accelerate end-to-end -end inference to deliver substantial performance, efficiency, and precision. This is the world's first language processing unit inference engine purpose-built for inference performance and precision. The LPU resides in the data center alongside CPUs and GPUs that enable training, and customers can choose on-premise deployment or API access. This delivers inference that wows with low latency and real-time delivery. If you'd like to watch the recent CNN interview demonstrating the speeds that the inference engine can pick up on and respond to with speech, check out the post that we've got in the Data Vault Innovators community, but I'll also post a link for you as well down in the description. By the way, the name Grok actually comes from an old science fiction novel called Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein, and it means to understand everything, especially when looked at deeply and with empathy. Right, that's it for the news this week. As I said before, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, spread the word about what's going on here, or head over to the Data Vault Innovators community and have your say. Speaking of the Innovators community, I had a chance this week to actually sit down and have a chat to one of their sponsors. Jonas de Cuesta, who is the Vice President of Marketing for Vault Speed, joined me for a conversation in, wasn't the wee small hours for me, but it was getting kind of late for him. It was, yeah, quite a fascinating one. I'm kind of interested to know why so many people who work in Data Vault seem to enjoy riding bikes. It's a bit weird. But look, you'll learn a bit more about that during this interview with Jonas right now, so stay tuned. Let's learn a little bit about him. Jonas, thank you very much for joining me. Very much appreciated. Um, I guess the first question for you is, what should people know about Vault Speed? Well, Vault Speed is a data warehouse automation tool or data lake house automation tool, whatever platform uh, you're trying to build uh, these days. Um, actually, our tool is 
is based on a methodology uh, called data vault um answer here on the show about the data vault innovator innovators community of course um and it's a two-fold approach um or we we, we actually also like to call it a two-staged approach like a rocket that has multiple stages you need to have these two stages to get into orbit into outer space it works a bit the same with volt speed and the two stages are as follows first um, we kind of help you to automate an integration layer based on data vault that's the first stage uh, for that we have set up um, uh, our product in a way that it's an entirely no code approach so you really uh, engage with our product through data modeling and based on the data models that uh, that you ingest in vault speed uh, your source data models uh, we build you a proposal and that proposal uh, is it's up to you to either accept those proposals or to change them a little bit and to change them towards what you actually need um, and if you've done enough of that modeling in vault speed you get your data integration layer your data vault layer uh, generated for you we generate the code we generate the the, the, the structure uh, the transformation code the workflow code everything um, and then you can get that integration layer up and running and then that second stage is actually where you can um, where you can build additional business logic on top of that very robust very uh, well structured uh, data integration layer and with that you could automate practically anything uh, into a star schema, a data mart, or anything else you, uh, you'd you like to use. It sounds like a very resilient model. Absolutely. Um, if you look at Data Vault, uh, we kind of, we've been calling it like the uh, foundation layer. So the, the actual layer where you put your Data Vault, we call it the foundation layer since 2010 i don't know ever since we started with data vault because it's indeed so resilient it basically acts as when you're building a house you build your foundation and on top of that you start building the the the, the additional floors right and it's a bit the same with data vault um it can act as the foundation for whatever you want to do next with your data whatever you want to do downstream uh or, or on those upper floors so uh it really it's really there to keep the house from falling apart uh that's that's how we look at that, it that's something everybody wants nobody wants a house that's going to fall apart no absolutely not <laughs> so how did you get into the world of data management then well um <laughs> it's uh it's a bit of a funny story because actually i i had a an education um in yeah we call it here in belgium we call it business engineering something like that um so it's uh, partially economics, uh, a lot of science, uh, exact science, and both both exact and human science, actually. Um, and I, I did a major in um, finance. So I was actually bound to go work in a bank or something. Um, and then when I started looking for a job, I stumbled across this uh, consulting company that did uh, data warehousing um, and everything that comes with it. And it kind of catched my interest uh so yeah next thing i knew i was working for them had a couple of interesting projects uh in in data warehousing building more the the downstream stuff the the presentation areas um also did some some work on reporting and dashboarding working with like end users business users um had a had a an interesting project for a while in in the UK, in London, um, and yeah, after after a while, um, we it became clear that the the consulting in in which I started um, was investing more and more in automation to distinguish themselves themselves from uh, uh, from let's say other companies that had a lot more manpower and and could build a lot more stuff with with uh, the amount of people that they had. Um, so we started being smart and we started investing in automation frameworks and then many years let's say five six years later uh, we ventured that into uh, what we know as vault speed today so um, it's a story of about 12 years now and uh, pretty interesting it's a long journey 
So, so how do you unwind then? Do you have a sports team that you support or do you play an instrument or build board games? <laughs> I'm not, no musical talent was lost to me. Uh, although I, I like feeling. music, but I, I, I'm really not good at it. Uh, playing a guitar or something, I would love to have been able to do it, but no, not at all. Uh, but I do like sports. Um, actually, I like, um, I'm a, a big fan, of course, we're here in Belgium, so people might know that we are big fans of cycling, um, mm -hmm. like pro road cycling. Um, and I did a bit of that, or quite a bit of that myself, uh, aged, I think, uh, 14 years old. I got my first uh, race bike and, uh, yeah, started training and, and later on also doing a few races. Um, Actually, the last race I did was well, already when I was working. I was uh, mm -hmm. that was in twenty sixteen, seventeen, something like oh, that. Wow. I think. Um, and then I, I I did a lot of cycling also in um, what we call Grand Fondos. Um, don't know if that term is known around Not the world, me. but it's like <laughs> these huge epic rides you can do in the alps or or in the mountain regions mountain uh, stages uh, you have in the like those big stages you have in the tour de france mm -hmm. um well they do them three weeks in a row we did one of those just uh as a amateur cyclist trying to do that as well so yeah i was quite fond of it um invested quite a lot of money in all the material and the stuff and the bike mm -hmm. and everything you need but uh yeah hobby like another and um <laughs> i still enjoy it although i have a little bit less time for it now i have two kids um oh, those take up so much time they don't like daddy to go out for the entire sunday morning <laughs> <laughs> do they get a say are they old enough to get a say on that <laughs> well they're young enough to for me to not have a say <laughs> let's oh, say let's put it like that yeah fair enough yeah um what about reading? What was the last book you read? Um, actually, I'm reading a book. Yeah, it's it's mix and match. Sometimes I read something that is more um, uh, tied to my professional life. So I'm mm -hmm. actually reading a book like right now. It's called Inspired. It's a book around product management and uh, yeah, getting new ideas on, on how to manage uh, products and products marketing. So that's, that's more uh, related to my professional uh, work, I would say. Um, otherwise, if I read a book purely for fun, um, for I, it, it should be a good thriller, a crime thriller. Um, I've read a few books from a guy called Alan Folsom, who mm -hmm. writes crazy. I think a few of his books were um, put into a, a movie. Um, John Grisham, same thing. Um, or some some books that are tied to uh, history. Um, I actually just ordered a book that talks, uh, there's this new, uh, Apple TV series online, which is called masters of the air. They follow the, the bombers in world war two and stuff. And actually it's based on a book. So I ordered the book, um, because, uh, someone I knew said, yeah, I should read it. It's a good historical piece. And it also tells a story about these people. And I, I like that. I, 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 it can be fiction for me, but if there's some historic event tied to it, that's uh, what I prefer. Paper, like paper books, or do you prefer to read digital on something like a Kindle? Uh, depends a little bit. Uh, yeah, for me, if it's let's say let's say it again, if it's professional, maybe just a Kindle that's easier, uh, or you can read it on on a but the. the Let's say if I'm uh, on a beach somewhere, I just like to hold a, an old fashioned book still. Mm -hmm. I'm the same. I'm exactly the same. What about television? Do you, do you have a favorite science fiction show or movie? Uh, science fiction to me, it should involve, um, uh, something about space. Uh, if you mm -hmm. show me a movie like, uh, interstellar or, um, uh, there's like this there's like a tv series as well on um on apple tv that's it's called uh uh 
for for all humankind or something uh, it's uh, for all mankind it's for all mankind that's it um yeah. it's a it's a series that is kind of a parallel universe between mm -hmm. what we know today and uh yeah what might have been if the space race had continued up until this point and it's uh it contains a little bit of everything it's mm. it's dramatic it's sci-fi it's uh, i mean they there's a series or, or season in there where in the like in the Middle East, the years 2000 2001 people are on mars and have a full blown um uh colony out there it's kind of sci-fi it's not that far out but it's mm -hmm. it's so, so for me it's realistic enough to still believe it um i really love yeah. the opening of that series where you know it, yeah. it sets it up but that's like funny like isn't it landing in the 60s and yeah that like that, that twist that it's the russians that have landed first that sets my up god everything. and then the yeah. neil armstrong's landing is like just barely and it's a yeah. whole other uh, a whole other story and uh also when uh i mean in the in the 60s in the us yeah uh, gender equality was mm -hmm. let's say not the hottest topic and then all of a sudden the russians brought the first woman to the moon and in the us like we need a bunch of female astronauts yeah. now and i i mean in a way it's also a funny series because they mm -hmm. uh they kind of play tricks on yeah guys we could have also done it like that um so yeah good uh a good watch for people that haven't oh, yeah. seen it yet it's a great show that one i actually need to catch up on the last season but the rest of it's been absolutely brilliant i've, I've really enjoyed it i finished season four i think uh last mm -hmm. december uh oh, okay. during the christmas <laughs> yeah. holidays yeah that's a good time to catch up on tv shows and you've got time to actually sit down and watch them absolutely yeah yeah um tell me do you have any pet peeves like little things that annoy you particularly when you're working with things like data management like like little things that a client might do or that, that seems to be sort of common practice that just bug you <laughs> um yeah there's there's definitely things that that would annoy me um i can't really think of one right now but like let's say just um pushing stuff out there that that hasn't been fully fully tested yet or fully completed like tinkering with code where people shouldn't really tinker with um i mean i i'm actually um when i was actually doing a data management projects myself still and that was i think up until 2021 i was still active on one of them i was i was somebody who always took like the practical approach like let's get shit done and uh and make sure that it works um and yeah sometimes that means you need to take uh you might need to take a little shortcut but as long as you realize that you made a shortcut and you know you can fix it later on um that's fine for me but if you start bending stuff and 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 yeah that that kind of that kind of that kind of annoys me um <laughs> another thing is people in data management there's a lot of people in data management that claim to know what they're talking about but don't really know mm -hmm. what they oh, are yeah. talking about <laughs> and uh yeah as soon as as soon as i catch uh people like that i'm like come on i mean let us let us handle it i mean yeah stay, stay clear because you don't know what you're saying um about well, things like that oh yeah no i've dealt with a lot of those in my time and they are so frustrating they just it's like the, yeah. the political beasts no the uh yeah the political animals uh those guys yeah Hard to yeah cope i think with. they know what's going on not a real clue but they'll throw out big words and think it makes them sound smart absolutely <laughs> yeah. um that's it that's like all my questions see super super fast super painless um where can people find more information about vault speed obviously on our website so uh www.voltspeed.com um and on that website there's like specific sections there's a resources section where you can read a lot of 
blog posts. Uh, we also have a community web page that is purely talking about full speed. Um, it kind of, it's kind of a place where you can learn from others that also use full speed. Uh, obviously, uh, us um, uh, Volt speeders are, are also in that community uh, to answer any questions about the product and, and stuff. So that's a very valuable resource. And yeah, um, I'd say people that really want to give Volt speed a try, we have these um, hands-on demo sessions where you can just register, get yourself a user, and uh, we talk you through uh, how the product works. That's uh, three of three very fast ways to get to know more about the product. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jonas. I'll let you get back to your evening so you can sleep and I do all the work during the day. Sounds like a really good setup for you, actually. Absolutely. I mean, uh, it's almost uh, half past 10 here. Um, Same here. I'll, I mean, I'll be watching. <laughs> I'll be, wa I'll be watching out for the recording when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> Fantastic. It'll be there waiting for you. Thank you very okay. much. Good to hear. See you, Paul. Bye. I, I want to thank Jonas again for sitting down and joining me for a conversation. It was incredibly educational, and I have to admit, very gracious with his patience because I kept screwing up the time zones between here and Europe, and he was incredibly patient and very kind about it. So thank you very much for that, Jonas. It is very much appreciated. Now, earlier this week, you may have heard about ChatGPT having a little bit of a weird kind of hissy fit or meltdown. On the 21st of February, for about six hours, ChatGPT started spewing nonsense and gibberish out to people. And I totally get it. I do exactly the same thing on the 21st of February every year. Because it's my birthday, I'm human, and the scepter of that inexorable march towards death gets closer and closer with every birthday I have... But ChatGPT doesn't have that problem because one, it's not human, but also it's a large language model built on black box technology. And that's a little bit of a problem here because that means, well, engineers might not be able to work out what the fault is that caused it. All they can do is create a bug patch for it so it doesn't happen again. But because they can't work out what the fault was, it means that they can't guarantee it's never going to happen again. And that's a real problem for anybody working on any kind of system. There comes questions with it around resilience and how to build system resilience and what you're doing and what you're building. But that reminded me of a piece of content that we actually made in December last year with Dan Lindstedt, who's the inventor of Data Vault. The question that they were asking was around the resilience of system building, because in Australia, not long before we recorded, one of their largest telcos actually went offline and 10 million people were without a form of communication. And that had far-reaching ramifications. So here's that conversation from December 2023 with uh, Dan Lindstedt, Michael Oshimke, Knowles Eberson, and Julian Redman when they take a look at the need for resilience in systems and what you could do to build more resilient systems going forward. The question came in separately to, to what just happened uh, over the last couple of days in Australia, but for, for Dan and Michael, we had our second largest telco go down for 12 hours, like literally no landline, no internet, no mobile phone, more than 10 million people affected. In a country of 25 million, that's, that's a lot. Um, hospitals are affected, transport systems are affected, and, and, and it, you know, it was chaos. And unfortunately, I happened to use that, that network. Um, so it was an interesting day. Um, the question's actually about resiliency. So um, how do you build resiliency in your platforms, especially around your information hubs, when lot, so much of where we're going is going to be based on, you know, the the data hub kind of idea? How do we start building resili resiliency into uh, into those systems when so much of it's automated uh, and maybe a bit black box? Uh, Dan, let's start with you on your thoughts. I'll try to keep it short. Um, and everybody chuckles when I say that because I'm long winded. But <laughs> but uh, so the uh, the first is you got to have a good governance program. The second is that you've got to have uh, 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 you you've got to have good security, uh, and you've got to be aware of privacy laws, because in order to have resiliency, you need a platform that can support replication, 
and this includes replication in the cloud. Now, if you're talking about an outage like you just mentioned, you better not be replicating in a cloud inside your country because your outage will be affected, your, your outage will affect every, everything in your own country. And this is why you need a security program or a cybersecurity program along with good governance so that you know what data you can replicate safely overseas or to another country, quote unquote, a friendly country, let's hope, right? Uh, mm. Because there are laws against promoting data or, or copying data to an unfriendly, quote unquote, country. Uh, mm. But there, beyond, it goes beyond that. You, the security officer uh, needs to be able to define policies that dictate, well, if this data is leaving our country, this stuff better be two-way encrypted or one-way encrypted or encrypted this way or, or stored you know, this way. So there's lots of different ways and, that, and you have to worry about in transit and everything else. Now, if you're using a platform like Snowflake, Snowflake makes it technically possible to copy stuff from country to country, cloud to cloud, just by turning it on. So without good mm -hmm. governance, you run a lot of risk. Right, without good policies and without good understanding of security, you run a tremendous amount of risk. But the flip side of that is resiliency. So if you have good governance and you have good security and you know you can follow the rules and meet the audits and the government regulatory uh, agency bodies and all that, then you can leverage a cloud in another country as resiliency as failover. But it still won't solve the accessibility problem if it's your telco that goes down, as the case you just mentioned, because everybody in that one country still can't get at their data. However, the rest of, if you're a global organization, and here's where it pays off. If you're a global organization, the rest of the organization can still get at the data, even though the telco in your country is down. Now, this also begs the use of cloud technology because when you come back online, the last thing you want is to scramble your IT resources to have them playing catch up, to, to have them funneling the data across and trying to figure out how to replicate the, you know, the most recent copies and all that. You want the tech platform to take care of it for you, to recognize all of the stuff that would have changed or didn't change or did change while you were gone. And, and when you came back online to sync, resync those databases for you. So all of that stuff should be expected from whatever platform you choose to build this on. And, and so th these are some of the things that, that uh, I would think of. Yeah, Michael, you got any thoughts? Uh, is this just a, you yeah. must have multi-cloud or is there more to it than that? Um, yeah, I would, I would say, um, I remember, so here's the thing. So, People make great plans and uh, how to deal with certain scenarios, but the the problem is, or what the number one, or what what for me at least a very important uh, action or a very important concept is. Um, I remember one client where we essentially came to the office one day and uh, working on some data warehouse project. That was actually pre before my data vault days, to be honest. Mm. But uh, it doesn't matter. So we were sitting there, and when I came, well, I came to the office and. Um, they everything was down because just like in your country nothing worked so all the file shares where they had the data didn't work it was production environment production um production uh, client in production mm -hmm. and um they couldn't produce anything no products the factories were down you, you couldn't work in the back it was nothing well first day we were making fun of it the first day but then end of business day we got a bit curious what's going on and then two days later sitting there i mean everybody was uh, heads down essentially the problem was they made a plan for a backup, and they backed up for years, and it worked for a while, apparently. Yeah? But then when they needed to restore something, they realized nobody tested the backup. So it didn't work, right? And um, that's what I, so testing, that's for me is a keyword here. I mean, we, we know a lot of tests in Data Vault, um, testing the metadata, checking for consistencies um, across the uh, naming conventions, for example, or how you, let's say, turn a, a data set uh, into a Data Vault, for example. We have regression tests, unit testing in data vault, how we test the business vault. We have tests for the, for the raw data vault and so on. But so many people don't do it. That's mm -hmm. weird, really, really weird in my opinion. So I would really emphasize testing here. Um, yeah. Hey. Yep. Good, 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 uh, good insight. Niles, do you have anything to add on this particular topic? 
it's one of those things that um, for organizations that were impacted, uh, some of them, this is not going to be cheap because it's we, we've we've leveraged the scale of economy and the cost savings about going to places like the cloud and all of those type of things. No need to maintain your own um, uh, data center and all those type of things anymore. And so that is uh, then resulted in we've we've got all these savings, except that it's not cheap because the redundancies, the resilience uh, has been neglected. So uh, so uh, not for everyone clearly, but some of the organizations out there, uh, that's directly here in the Australian context, but I think there is, it, it's a, uh, a wake up call to most organizations that some of them will have to go all the way from, uh, okay, just upgrade my subscriptions to actually bring the jackhammers because we need to put in more connections. And so there's, there's gonna be some yeah. literally physical and virtual impacts to all of this. But it's not necessarily a bad thing to be to have these reminders come around, uh, and I say that from a perspective. For instance, we had bushfires uh, not far from our farm uh, in the last little while, and we've you know we've had ideas on how to do and fight the bushfires, etc. And then when the bushfires became real, well, the measures became real, right? And so. Fortunately, all of our efforts were a dry run, which is awesome, but it highlighted a few things. And so I want to echo what Michael has said. It's one thing to have resilience. It's another thing whether you've tested it. And so, uh, yeah. absolutely. So sometimes these, yeah. these unfortunate incidents should form a good basis for getting some rigor or governance or um, resilience back into focus yeah i feel like there's um you know there's so many so this isn't just a technical problem either right there's a there's a you've got to think at a business level where are our single points of failure in this example everyone in their business used their own network so as soon as their network was down they couldn't communicate with each other yep. that delayed the the fix by hours you know it's so you have to think, you know, and there's a cost to having a backup network or a backup to to everything Absolutely. in your infrastructure. But you got single points of failure, and that's where it's going to fail, right? So that was a pretty fascinating conversation to sit down and listen to, particularly in light of what we've had in the last week and what they were dealing with at the time. And they are fantastic experts with a huge amount of knowledge that I'm not going to argue with. But if you want to have a chat to them or get to meet other experts, don't forget you can always visit the Data Vault Innovators community, which is magically appearing on screen like magic again right now. It's also, again, in the description below. It's completely free to join. Hop on over, come say hi, and get to meet all of the others out there. In the meantime, if you're in or around London on, say, the 14th of March, make sure you check out what Scale Free are doing. They've got a great big meet up over there for people of the Data Vault Innovators community. It's a one-day workshop, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there. So make sure you check out their website or the information that you can find on that Data Vault Innovators community. Until next week, I've been your host, Paul Barlow. Thank you very much for joining me. And once again, may the force be with you.